I'm ready. All right, good. All right, so our first invited talks uh, gonna be by Patrick Baidzonka, Max Planck Institute. He's gonna be telling us about breaking the TUR with uh, classical pendulum clocks. Thank you, Jason, and thanks to the organizers for, for having me. So my talk will be about, uh, about clocks. And one very famous example is uh, the clock behind Big Ben. And uh, so I'm wondering what is the energy that you need to drive a clock? And I found one interesting video about how Big Ben is, is wound up. And uh, you see, it takes two strong men. They take turns in winding up uh, the clock for one and a half hours. They do that three times per week. So it takes lots of energy, but in the end, most of that energy just gets, uh, or all of that energy just gets dissipated. And the reason why there is so much dissipation going on is just because it has heavy gears and there's lots of friction going on. So an obvious solution to that problem to make a, a clock more efficient would be to shrink it down to a smaller size. So for example, if you look at a wristwatch, uh, it can be just as precise as Big Ben, but it takes, uh, uh, say it takes much less energy to, to wind it up. Now you can wonder how far can you push that strategy? How small can you make a clock? And then you end up at these circadian clocks that you find, for example, in bacteria. And uh, there is one problem there that if you go down to this molecular scale, then there's always the thermal noise acting on, on uh, your mechanism. So that might make it unprecise and you need to supply sufficient energy to outrun these thermal fluctuations. So given that one could believe that in fact, there is a minimal energetic cost for operating a precise clock. And this is of course formulated or was the motivation to formulate uh, the thermodynamic uncertainty relation, which uh, I don't need to go into detail here anymore. Uh, so in the, in, for the example of a clock, your X of T would just be some integrated current that is the time shown by the clock. And uh, we have the rate of entry production, which is also the, the amount of energy you need to supply to that clock. And it has only very few, few um, prerequisites to derive that equation. So namely, you need to have a steady state, you need to have time independent driving, and uh, you need to look at some time asymmetric current, which would be the case here. And then there is one uh, uh, thing I want to focus on here is that it's proven for Markov jump processes. And also it was soon proven for, for over damped large van dynamics. But so far, we are still lacking a good understanding of under the Brownian motion. So what we're talking about is a large Van equation like this one here, where you have uh, a deterministic equation basically for, for x, which is just given by the velocity. And the velocity itself undergoes Newtonian uh, dynamics with some friction term, uh, an external force or potential force F, and the usual uh, Gaussian thermal noise. And now if we want to derive a UR for that, then there are a couple of problems. So one easy way would be to just try and discretize the system, but then we have these transitions in X, which formally look like uh, uh, irreversible transitions. And it's not obvious how one can uh, get a non-divergent entropy production from that. Also, we have to somehow distinguish the reversible currents that you always have in, uh, in equilibrium the currents in phase space and uh, the real irreversible currents. So one irreversible current would be what I show here, just the average velocity of a particle. And uh, the problem is that for under them dynamics, the phase space density rho and uh, such a current observable are coupled. Namely, the current is just the average velocity in the phase space. So the usual trick that we apply in level 2.5 large deviations or in the Kramer-Rauer um, theory uh, doesn't production, but also on other quantities. So still there was uh, some uh, interesting uh, observation, namely that there should still be an underdamped TUR for, um, in that case. 
And that is based on the, the observation that one can calculate that uncertainty product uh, Q exactly for free underdamped diffusion subject to a biasing force F, a constant biasing force. And this is what I show here, that uncertainty product as a function of the time interval. And as expected, basically, for short time intervals, you have a ballistic regime where you can be very precise. But uh, the statement would really be that in the long time limit, you would still get the familiar uh, right-hand side of two for that function. This is what is shown here in black. And uh, the idea is what usually used to hold for overdamp dynamics is that whenever we use some pattern of a, of a potential landscape, then this will become less precise. So that uncertainty product will be bigger than that. And that is what, indeed what was observed for uh, a one-dimensional system. If you show a look here in purple at different um, uncertainty products for, uh, for different uh, randomly drawn potential landscapes, then always uh, we are above this bound given by the free diffusion. So it looked like this is really uh, that the, the underdamped, uh, uh, in the underdamped case that you are would still hold. And uh, one thing uh, that I was worried about is that this is not really proven yet. And uh, basically our favorite example of a clock uh, could in principle be underdamped and uh, it's therefore not waterproof yet. And that's what uh, motivated me to look more into how clocks work. And uh, if you just follow the history of the development of clocks, then uh, basically the first example is uh, a sand clock or an hourglass. And in my opinion, that works more or less uh, similar to what we've just discussed. It's just some degree of freedom, the, the amount of uh, sand that has fallen down that is subject to a constant force, namely gravity. So by all that we understand so far about a TUR, it would surely hold for this type of, of sand clock. But it took um, several centuries until there was an uh, important uh, new concept entering the business of designing clocks, and that is due to Galileo, who was the first to really realize that uh, the, uh, the period of a pendulum is independent of its amplitude. And that might make it a good candidate, candidate to, to operate a clock, because uh, it's, uh, if it gets some bump from, uh, from the surrounding environment, then it might just increase its amplitude but it will uh, not change its period. Whereas if you look at that particle on a ring, if that gets a thermal bump, uh, then it will uh, start uh, rotating quicker for some period or for some time until that extra energy is dissipated again. So in fact, Galileo was using that mechanism for his experiments and he was just uh, counting oscillations of a clock in his, in his uh, mind. But uh, the problem for applying the uncertainty relation to such a setting is really that uh, the pendulum doesn't go anywhere. It just swings back and forth and there is no way to identify a, a, an irreversible current that we would, could apply the uh, uncertainty relation to. But uh, there's help coming actually from Christian Huygens who is uh, considered the inventor of the pendulum clock who was the first to couple the swinging motion of a pendulum to a so-called escape wheel, that is uh, that golden cork shown here, that is loaded by some weight so that it would rotate in, uh, in clockwise direction if left on its own. And that escapement mechanism ensures that with every swing of a pendulum, uh, this wheel rotates by one notch. And uh, that is exactly what is needed because now we could in principle apply the TUR to the rotations of this cork here. And uh, my idea was to, uh, to find a simple uh, thermodynamically consistent model for such a system, but uh, obviously uh, this would be very hard to model all these moving degrees of freedom. So I was trying to come up with a minimal model that just has a discrete counter observable Y and uh, a continuous oscillator observable X. And uh, that counter observable is basically just uh, uh, a degree of freedom that is biased in a clockwise direction. You can imagine there is some weight applied to it. Now the idea is, is uh, that I couple uh, the counter to that oscillator 
by introducing barriers. And the barriers make sure that, uh, so they change their position and they make sure that with every swing of the pendulum, we have more or less one uh, jump of that uh, counter observable. And what I need to make sure is that I account for thermal noise in both degrees of freedoms and the temperature for both types of noise should be equal. Otherwise I might by accident construct some heat engine. Okay, so this is basically what I want to model. So I use transition rates for that degree of freedom Y, which are uh, K plus and K minus. And their log ratio defines an affinity, basically the energy difference that you uh, turn over in every step of that counter degree of freedom. And uh, these barriers I introduced by just saying that dependent on where my pendulum is, whether it's on the right or on the left, they, then I multiply these uh, rates by a tiny epsilon. So by doing that, I'm not changing the affinities. So uh, the pendulum doesn't need to do any work but uh, somehow still that uh, counter process is observing what the pendulum is doing. Now I define a tick as the event of X of T, that oscillator here passing through zero. And by N of T, I uh, define the, the process that counts the number of ticks up to a time T. Now I also assume that these rates K plus and K minus are very large such that I have a fast equilibration after a tick uh, compared to the time scale uh, that it takes for the pendulum to swing. And under that assumption, I have a very simple Boltzmann distribution after a tick. So I have a probability of being in the upper state or the lower state that is given just by that, uh, should be normalized of course, uh, by this uh, Boltzmann distribution uh, depending on the affinity. And uh, in the, uh, in the end, I can come up with an effective description. Uh, basically, I have an asymmetric random walk where in every swing of the pendulum, I can either go to the next pair of states, or if uh, I end up in the minus state, I go back to the previous pair, pair of states. And I have discrete jump probabilities, P plus and P minus. And uh, I have some discrete time, N of T, uh, behind that uh, asymmetric random walk. That, that is itself stochastic. And now I can do all the, the algebra, which I'm gonna spare you. I'm, I'm just going to show you the, the final result. And that is um, that I can calculate the uncertainty product that I've been talking about before. The variance uh, is what I can calculate. And uh, what enters here is basically the entry reduction rate of the counter itself. That is a simple uh, quantity that just depends on the average speed of that counter multiplied by the affinity. Then uh, uh, on the right hand side, I get a more or less simple algebraic function that accounts for the two sources of noise that we have. So one is this, uh, the noise that comes from the counter itself, which basically depends on its affinity A. And the other is the noise that comes from the oscillator process which is described through that Fano factor, uh, where I look at diffusion coefficient associated with that uh, ticking process uh, divided by its mean. And in the end, I have this function, which I need to, to uh, analyze now. And what you see on the right-hand side are plots of that function here. And uh, so you see if uh, I have a small Fano factor R here, then I'm safe, then basically for any affin uh, affinity that I might try out, then always will be above the value of two that corresponds to the, to the usual QR. But uh, it gets dangerous when R gets smaller than a, uh, than a third, then you see that there are some values of A and I can tune A freely for which uh, I get a right-hand side that is smaller than F. So you see, uh, that the TUR can be broken if uh, I manage somehow to get a final factor smaller than a third. And also if I have no additional entry reproduction for the oscillator, because that so far has only been the entry reduction of the counter. So you see, we need to talk about the dynamics of the oscillator. And uh, a very simple choice is just to say that 
the, the pendulum is basically uh, an underdent harmonic oscillator that is itself in equilibrium, because that way I'm making sure that it doesn't produce any entropy of its own. But this is a simple algebra equation for a harmonic potential. And I know already that I should get a Boltzmann distribution with uh, that quadratic NF energy function. Then I can define my ticking process, which is just the sequence of jumps whenever I pass through zero. I realized that by having this delta function that uh, acts on x of t and uh, integrating that would give me the number of ticks up to some point in time t. I can fairly easily get the mean ticking rate that is just uh, an average using that Boltzmann distribution and it's in the end just omega over pi. What is a bit more tricky is to calculate the dispersion coefficient of, um, of that, uh, of the diffusion coefficient of that uh, ticking process. So there's one term here that just depends on the self-correlation of every tick with itself. And then uh, plus that I have um, an integral over the correlation function. And this correlation function is what I can calculate analytically for that harmonic oscillator. And it's what I show here. You see uh, the, the, uh, that it's uh, quite likely to have another tick separated by multiples of the period of that pendulum. And what I need to do to get that dispersion coefficient is I need to calculate the integral over that. And this should compensate this plus one half factor here by giving me, my, me minus one over six, such that in the end I break the uncertainty relation by having less than a third. And if we plug in some numbers here, so basically the only parameter that we have is the damping coefficient, then you see that there is a critical value of the damping coefficient which I numerically determine as 0.981. I triple checked, it's not one, it's 0.981 plus uh, something. And uh, this is still fairly strong damping, but what you see here, this is already sufficient to, to get me below that threshold. And if I take an even smaller value of the damping, 0.2, for example, then I clearly violate that bound here. So we see that in that simple model, indeed we can violate the thermodynamic uncertainty relation, but you could still argue that this is a somehow artificial uh, setting where I use both a discrete degree of freedom and a continuous one. So is the TUR still violated if I use a fully continuous setting? So if I have two degrees of freedom, X and Y, that are subject to some potential and uh, where I have uh, an external force acting in direction Y. And now, uh, inspired by a pendulum clock, I would want that uh, X still undergoes an oscillating motion. So I uh, use a harmonic oscillator potential for X. And now I want uh, a coupling potential uh, that, uh, uh, that kind of ensures two things. First, I want to have a constant speed or as much as possible constant speed in Y of T, which I choose to be the terminal velocity associated with that external force. And also I want to have a kind of feedback mechanism that maintains the pendulum at a amplitude that is bigger than just uh, the, the equilibrium amplitude. That is, that is what an actual pendulum clock does. And so if I impose that uh, this amplitude is just A uh, times uh, the sine function of omega times T, then I get an ideal trajectory that is shown here in red uh, which uh, has uh, some period determined by the external force. And now I would like to enforce the motion along this ideal trajectory by using some potential that penalizes deviations from the ideal trajectory. And now if I run that continuous model uh, using a package of, of non-interacting test particles, so for comparison, I show here on the left, uh, a free particle without any coupling potential on, and on the right I show that coupling potential, then you see that if you start such a package, then uh, on the left you will see that the package spreads out much more, or at least a little bit more than what you see on the right hand side. And uh, so if you analyze uh, statistically how this package of particles spreads, then you see indeed 
what I show here in black goes to one, that is just the free particle that I show on the left that goes to two in the long time limit. But if I use these well-designed uh, potentials mimicking, mimicking a clock, then on the right-hand side uh, of the TUR, I get something that is indeed smaller than two. So now we see that uh, indeed the thermodynamic uncertainty relation for underdamped dynamics can be broken, but still I think it's unclear what would be the, the true TUR for underdamped dynamics. If I just tell you the, what the energy budget is, how precise can uh, I design a clock? There have been some suggestions on what the true TUR could be. There are some older suggestions and also some more recent ones, but somehow they often depend on, on extra quantities. So I think the definitive answer to that has still not been found. Also, I'm quite confused about what was wrong with my argument that I presented on the first slide. Basically that if you're close to equilibrium, it would be hard to outrun thermal fluctuations. So why does this not lead necessarily to imprecise clocks? What is wrong about that basic argument for the, the, the TUR? And also one open problem is that we still have no counterexample or proof in one deed. So we don't know whether for simple one dimensional systems, the TUR is also broken. So far it looks like it's not because we have very strong numerical evidence. But I hope that by the time we have our next BOST meeting, we will find better answers to all of that. So with that, I'd like to thank for your attention.